Welcome to Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA players, legends, and top instructors share their stories, insights, and playing lessons. Join Chris every Tuesday night as he talks with the greats of the game. Tonight's show is sponsored by the French Lick Resort, the PGA Tour Superstore, TaylorMade Golf, the Bobby Jones Apparel Company, Two Under, Ben Hogan Golf, Golf Pride, Srixon and their Z-Star Golf Balls, and the Sandiston Resort. Now here is your host, Chris Mascaro. Good evening, folks. How are you? Thank you so much for coming back and joining me this week on Next on the T. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro. Tonight, I'm going to be joined by a couple of PGA Tour legends and Larry Mowry and David Ogren. Plus, I'm going to get a return visit from Par 4 Success founder, Chris Finn. Larry Mowry, you guys are going to remember, he was a mini tour, Florida mini tour warrior and a legend. Won a lot of times out on that tour. Came over to the PGA and the senior PGA tour. Won six times in total. Five of them coming on the Champions Tour. None bigger than the 1989 Senior PGA Championship at PGA National Golf Club. Tonight, I want to get Larry's thoughts on the PGA Tour playoff system and the Tour Championship here at East Lake. Larry lives in the Atlanta area and I also want to get his thoughts on that local event. Also want to go back and get his memories playing alongside legends like Jack Nicholas, Arnold Palmer, and Gary Player. Was he ever intimidated by those guys? Intimidated maybe the first time he had an opportunity to get paired with one of those guys? Or did the Florida Mini Tour really harden him and prepare him for what it would be like to play against really anybody? I want to get his thoughts on that. I also want to go back to the 1987 Crestar Classic and talk with him about how he was a Monday qualifier for that tournament. And he made history becoming the first Monday qualifier in senior tour history to go on and win the tournament. want to get his memories about that. A lot of other things as well. wanted to get him to weigh on. He's a great instructor of the game now. So I want to talk a little bit about the things he's doing with his students here in Atlanta. Really looking forward to having Larry back with me. And he's going to join me in just a few minutes. Following him, I'm going to get a visit from another PGA Tour legend, like I mentioned, David Ogren. David played his college golf at Texas A&M. Won three times. During his college career, again, some high-powered competition, particularly the guys at the University of Houston. We'll talk about those guys. One of them was Fred Couples. So I want to talk about what it was like playing against that level of competition at the college level, not, not to mention getting out on the PGA Tour as well. David played on tour from 1983 to 2000. He won the 1996 Texas Open by one stroke over Jay Haas and, over, and two strokes by a guy you might have heard of, Tiger Woods. So I want to talk about what that victory meant to him, particularly not just the fact that he got his first tour win there, but doing so as a Texas Ag Texas A&M Aggie alumni right there, sort of in front of your adopted home state. What was that like? We'll hear about that and a whole lot more when David joins me later on in this half hour. Then we'll round out tonight's show, like I say, with a return visit from Chris Finn, founder of Power for Success. I'm going to talk to Chris about proper nutrition before and during our rounds. How do we make sure that we are not too bogged down by eating a huge breakfast, but we're fueled and ready for our, uh, our round of golf. And then as we start to get hungry, maybe around the turn, what things should we be eating? I'm guessing one of those things isn't a hot dog. So we'll talk to Chris about that. We'll talk about staying properly hydrated out there. We'll talk about stretching in order to be our, get our bodies prepared you know, for our round of golf. Also, some things we can do to get a little more club head speed, maybe get a little more distance on our shots. We'll talk about all of that and a whole lot more when Chris joins me about 45 minutes from now. So there you have it, folks. Again, more great stories and playing lessons coming your way tonight on this edition of Next on the Tee. And as always, I thank you so much for tuning in and taking the journey with me tonight. Before we get started, you always like to kick things off by reminding you about a couple of other great golf shows that are out there. First of all, Talking Golf Getaways with my friend Mitch Lawrence and his co-host Darren Bunch. They let you know about great places to go stay, play, and even eat and drink when you're out there. You can stream their podcast over on Golf Trip X, and that's the letter X, so GolfTripX.com. It's also available on places like Audio Boom, Stitcher, and Player.fm as well. Go there, check out their show, and learn about some of the hidden gems that we have around the country that you can play. His twin brother Matthew also has a great golf show. It's called Backspin Golf, and it airs Sunday mornings from 8 to 9 a.m. Eastern Time on WLXG ESPN Radio, AM 1300 up in Lexington, Kentucky. You can stream the show online by going to WLXG.com or doing what I did, which is download the WLXG app, and you can stream it right there on your smartphone. Matthew always makes the show so much fun to listen to. A lot of great golfing content as well. It's a great way to start your Sunday mornings. 
Again, it's called Backspin Golf, and you can stream it online by going to WLXG.com or download the WLXG app. And this segment of the show, folks, is sponsored by our good friends over at the French Lick Resort. Let's hear about what they've got going on this summer. It's a Pete Dye masterpiece, the Pete Dye course at French Lick Resort. Pete says its location on one of the highest points in Indiana makes it special. The long views, you can see many 20 and 30 miles from many of the fairways and many of the tees and greens, and, and you can see it in 360 degrees. Donald Ross's hill course put French Lick on the golf map more than 100 years ago. It's where Walter Hagen won the 1924 PGA Championship and the place where today's Symmetra Tour ladies battle each year. It's the ambience around it that makes the golf course. Combine our many resort amenities with legendary golf, and you have a getaway like no other. French Lick Resort is the home of the Senior LPGA Championship, won in 2018 by World Golf Hall of Famer Laura Davies. Play the course's champions play. Plan your trip now, online at FrenchLick.com. Yeah, folks, go online to FrenchLick.com to see for yourself. What a wonderful place they have up there and to book your stay as well. And, well, folks, TaylorMade Golf has done it again. The TaylorMade M5 and M6 drivers are a tremendous story. They both feature speed-injected twi uh, twist face, created through a revolutionary manufacturing process where every single head, and I keep telling you, every single head is injected and calibrated to the threshold of the legal limit. Basically, every head is made to be tour spicy. So speed for all of us. Check it out online by going to TaylorMadeGolf.com. And to play a ball with ultimate spin and stopping power, you need a physics-defying cover. With molecular bonds that stretch but don't break, to play a ball that goes far and feels soft, you need a fast layer core with incredible feel and maximum distance. They're only in the new Z-Star and Z-Star XV golf balls, and they're only from Strixon Golf. Please also check out our friends at the Bobby Jones Apparel Company by going online to bobbyjones.com. They've got their semi-annual sale going on right now, savings of up to 50% on some items. In fact, their best-selling performance polo style shirts are up to 60% off. See it all online by going to bobbyjones.com. All right, folks, now back in, with me here on the French Lick Resort guest line is Larry Mowry. Let me remind you a little bit about Larry's background. He is from San Diego, California. Turned pro in 1959. He won the 1968 Rebel Yell Open at Holston Hill Country Club up in Knoxville, Tennessee. He also won the 1969 Magnolia Classic. The Florida Open was another one of his victories. He won that tournament twice in 79 and 83. Plus, he also won the 1979 Colorado Open. He won five times on the Champions Tour, including the 1989 Senior PGA Championship by one stroke over Miller Barber and Al Guyberger. On the Champions Tour, he's got, you know, five of those wins, uh, you know, so that's one thing, right? Five big wins. He also had seven runner-up finishes, five third-place finishes, 52 top tens, and 104 top 25 finishes. And I'm very honored he is back with me again tonight here on Next on the Tee. Good evening, Larry. Thank you for coming back on the show. Well, thank you very much, Chris. I think I'll leave now after that introduction. <laughs> <Well ahead. laughs> I appreciate you. So, Larry, I know you're local here now in Atlanta. Curious to get your thoughts. Did you get an opportunity to go out to East Lake and see any of the tour championship this past weekend? No, I didn't. You know, the uh, I, I really enjoy watching it on, on television, quite frankly. Uh, and uh, plus, the, the uh, it, I'm 82 now, so it's... Uh, <clears throat> wandering around that golf course is a little bit more than I, I can handle uh, at this point walking, you know. So uh, I'd rather watch it on TV and uh, get to see what the guys are doing in that vein. What, what about your thoughts about the tour championship? You know, sort of the, the, the format that they had, right? That sort of staggered leaderboard where Justin Thomas started out 10 under and on, and on down it went. What did you think about how it got set up and how they decided who uh, the tour champion would be? Yeah, it. I, I, I get. You know, there the players seem to seem to be in favor of it, and uh, if if that's the case, that means that they felt that under the past format, uh, the uh, guy that worked all year long and was uh, leading in the points didn't really uh, um, have any edge. You know, was another you know another tournament, but with that big prize money. It turned out all right somehow, you know what I mean? You got all the uh, really good players right in there. 
So, you know, somehow it all worked out fine. I want to take you back a little bit, and I know you had an opportunity to play alongside some of the greatest legends in the history of the game, guys from the 70s, 80s, 90s. Was it ever intimidating for you to get paired with someone like a Jack Nicholas, an Arnold Palmer, Gary Player, some of those guys, maybe the first time that uh, you found yourself on the on the pairing sheet next to one of the one of their names? Was that ever intimidating to you? Yeah, it was. I mean, Jack. In fact, it's funny when Jack first came out uh, before he won, won all the you know before he won the U.S. Open. We were all kidding him and very relaxed around him, and suddenly he started winning, and we realized that uh, he was like <clears throat> really extra special. And uh, I, I I choked every time I play with Jack. I mean, that's one of the things that uh, that I, I wish I could have changed in my career, but uh, that it's just the way it turned out. Uh, uh, I tightened up on every first seat, but he would look at you and he was a, the friendliest guy in the world. I mean, he was perfectly friendly and, uh, uh, but he would look at you with those eyes and like he could read your mind and maybe your soul. And it's like, whoa, you know, you feel like, uh, <laughs> you, you were in a ball game. When, uh, uh, I remember when I first, when I played with Jack in, in the tournament, I can't remember if it was Portland or, or Seattle. I think it might have been Portland. And he won the uh, uh, tournament in Seattle. And I think it was in Portland uh, where he got a two, Joe Black, a tournament official then for the PGA Tour, or uh, PGA of America really ran it. And uh, the uh, uh, he gave Jack a two-shot penalty for slow play. I, You know, I, I think wow. that's the only one. That, yeah, he Nailed him real good, and the jack started walking, <clears throat> started walking fast in between shots. Kind of something that uh, DeChambeau is doing right now. The same thing. Try to try to make up for the time. Well, anyway, after all that time, you know, and here Jack had now had won the. You know, we were so ca- casual talking to him and everything, uh, and so now he'd won the Open here. He'd just won C- Seattle, and now here he is in. The, with a two shot uh penalty and still in the lead uh at uh, Portland. Anyway, so uh Butch Baird and I are paired with Jack the last round. And uh it, the first hole was like a really easy par five and uh they both knocked on the green about eight, eighteen feet from the pin and uh I was just short and I chipped up about uh four inches from the hole and tapped it in. And Jack asked me, <clears throat> he said, Larry, who's out? And I looked around there and I didn't, I didn't know how nervous I was at the time. <clears throat> and I said, I think you're out. I mean, I could, it sounded like somebody <laughs> squeezed a rubber hose, an air hose talking <laughs> through my throat. I thought, holy God. So anyway, uh, Jack got kind of a kick out of me. He didn't say anything. He, as I was coming down to nine, I made some bogeys after that and I made some birdies like, seven and eight and uh he came over to me and put his arm on my shoulder and said i didn't want to say anything to you i thought it might make you more nervous he says but i see you made some birdies you're okay now and uh he's just a nice guy uh, but they yeah i was really intimidated I, you know it's amazing palmer palmer was one where when i i played with palmer a bunch and and uh he was i i had had a good time playing with him but there was one time when we we played the last round of the uh, senior open and uh, and it was in uh, the U.S. Open and it was in Connecticut and we're we're paired the the last round and uh, big crowds there and Arnold was really going good right during that time so anyway so we're he, he he we both hit our tee shots and it was a long par four and up uphill second shot and. Uh, the crowd cheered Arnold from the time he left the tee down the fairway, kept going and going and going. And I, I got, uh, I thought, wow, I've never seen this happen before. Anyway, so we got to, uh, uh, I hit my second shot short of the green. Arnold was up on the, uh, uh, on the green and the crowd was cheering, cheering, cheering in it. It got to me. I got a little, uh, I got like misty. I got misty eyed with it. And I looked down at my ball to try to chip. And I can't see the ball. I'm, you know, 
So I had to ask the caddy. <laughs> Meanwhile, Arnold's got his hands on his hips looking at me, wondering what in the world I'm doing. And uh, so I wipe, pretend and uh, wipe my face off. And, cover, and I could finally see the ball. I chipped up and made par. And as we went on, every single tee, every single fairway, every single green, 18 holes of it, they cheered for that man the whole time, all the way around. And uh, there was one hole. There was there was a kind of a condo on one side, and and uh, the, the you know one of those fourplex condo unit things. And uh, one one had a banner, and it said Arnie's Army, go Arnie, and all that kind of stuff. And he he called me over. He says, look at this. I want to show you something. He says, see, that's a hand painted banner there. That isn't some factory thing or something that, you know, that they did that on their, in their kitchen. And uh, he said, you know, that's really special. And he said, don't ever forget those people that do special things just to make you feel good, you know. And uh, that's the kind of guy that man was. I mean, he was uh, unbelievable. Well, anyway, it was there that I shot 71 that round. I think Arnold shot 73. And uh, <clears throat> I had to leave that tournament to go to Syracuse the next week, which meant I got to drive from Connecticut up to Syracuse, New York, and um, qual- <clears throat> qualify the next morning. But uh, I told my wife, and uh, we were driving up, and I said, you know, don't worry about me from here on in. And I said, I can handle it. That uh, uh, that really just told me that uh I can play under the pressure. There's nothing going to bother me, and everything's fine. Hey, you know, Larry, I, I read a story that said that, um, and it might have been actually coming out of that very same tournament you were just talking about, how when you were paired with Mr. Palmer and seeing the way the fans reacted to him changed your opinion about how important the people that are there to watch you play. You changed your opinion about those folks. Do you remember that? Do you remember, like why, What about that changed? how you felt previously to what what you witnessed with Mr. Palmer. Well, you know, when when you're uh, as a young player, I don't know if you really appreciate it all that much. You're worried about how you're doing and all that. But when after I saw that, I just said, man, just enjoy those people out there on the sideline. Talk to them if you can. Smile to them. At least do that instead of frowning all day long you know, how serious you are so, so i and it really did help my my golf game after that uh i loosened up and uh, i would talk to them and uh and just say things just to recognize that their fact that they're there uh uh it was uh it was just a it, it did change the way i looked in fact i played a lot better from that point on you know and gary player you mentioned gary Gary was probably the uh, a guy that I uh, could talk to better than you know closer than than most guys. I would always talk to him about how I wanted to play and I wanted to stay out there. It was hard to you know during that period of time that was a very hard tour to get on as a, kind of an outsider. You know they have rules now if you won a tournament blah 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 you can go play, but back then you know you had to uh, finish I think. I can't remember something like uh, 30th on the money list or something like that to be to be exempt. And that was very, very hard. So uh, uh, and especially when you had to qualify every week. I never missed qualifying in that thing. I, not one time. And uh, so um, anyway, with Gary, I would always talk to Gary and say, I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. And pretty soon I'm going to be able to beat you there, boss, you know, and and. Uh, Finally, we got to the uh, Crest Star, and I qualified. And uh, uh, don't you know I'm playing with Gary the last round? We we got to the – it's an interesting story because I got to the 15th hole. It was a par five, and I hit my drive out of position. The green was kind of sideways, and it was a very narrow kind of kind of green. And uh, par five, and water hazard. I had to go over the, a little water hazard, and probably if I missed the green one over, I'd have no shot at all of making birdie coming back. I was just dead, you know, So because um, there was humps there and everything. Anyway, so uh, Gary laid up, and he had a one-shot lead on me at that particular time, and I thought to myself, I'm not going to do what what he wants me to do, which is I'm going to go 
He wants me to lay up right next to him, and we'll have a pitching contest. And he's one of the best guys with those with a 60-yard shot you're ever going to see in your life. I mean, the guy, he's brutal. So uh, I thought, I can't win if I do that. You know, the only way I can win is I took a five-word out. It's about, you know, we're, we're going by... Uh, 1987 yardages, which are, you know, it's grossly different than it is now. But I could hit a five with about 235 in the air if I killed it, you know. And I just hit a big old high five iron and said, well, if it goes the length in the lake short, that's it. And I don't you know, I put it right in the middle of that green. And uh, <clears throat> Gary didn't hit a good shot. He made par on that par five. And I two putted for for birdie. Now we're tied. And we tie 16, 17 on 18. Uh, I didn't. I didn't even. I didn't hit a very good shot into the green. I had about a 35 footer uh, for birdie, and uh, Gary was about 20 feet. And don't you know, I knocked the 35 footer in. Boom! Gary misses. And so when the we finished our round, we still had I think uh, Miller Barber and uh, Dale Douglas and Chichi behind us, and uh, he. Where my wife and I are kind of behind the scores, Tim was right, right behind the green. And we're peeking around the thing. We didn't want to be obnoxious looking at guys, you know, what, if one of them made a birdie, they would tie me. And, uh, Gary grabbed us both by the hand. He says, come on, let's go sit in the stands. There was some room there in the stands. And, uh, uh, we sat down and he said, let, he says, let's watch these guys try to, uh, make a birdie and tie you. And, and, and anyway, so they uh, they missed. I won the tournament, and Gary congratulated us. And I thought then, now here's another guy who uh, would look at people, and he's not afraid to, uh, uh, because of his great playing ability, to give someone else credit for doing something good. You know, that's uh, that's a special guy there, too. I, I found all the great players to be uh kind of really special individuals. And just a, a side note to that, and you, you sort of, as you were telling the story, but you became, you, it was the first time that a Monday qualifier on the Champions Tour would go on to win the tournament. So you said the, you were the first guy to do that. So that had to be a little extra special for you as well. That was. They had crazy rules back and then. Uh, that got me in, but, I mean, I didn't play. I the uh, you know I went to high school and grade school and everything in Newport, Rhode Island, and uh, they had the next tournament was up in Newport, Rhode Island. I mean up the Newport Country Club. So uh, I called and and said, okay, I won the tournament. I head up to Newport, and they said, no, you're not in the Invitational. <laughs> you won a tournament, <laughs> anyways. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So then the next week we're down in Atlanta, and I won it in Atlanta. Plan as it turns out, with Palmer. Palmer had a four-shot lead going into the last round. I was tied with Gary for second place, and I I won that one. I shot 66 and won it. And uh, so now I've won two tournaments. And I think I there was like Las Vegas, and there's a tournament in Palm Springs, or it might have been some other tournament. Anyway, there uh, I didn't get in uh, in any of those. With the uh, with the wow. uh, two wins, you know. But however, the next time out, the next year, I got to Vegas, and it really uh, kind of burnt me that I didn't get invited to Vegas because I'd I'd lived there for uh, uh, about four or five years, and uh, I, so I, I so in in '88 I got out there to that uh, they couldn't keep me out because I was like I think I finished 13th on the money list or something like that. So anyway. Uh, so I'm in all those tournaments now, the invitationals and everything else. So I, I won at Vegas, beating Bob Charles, uh, coming down the stretch, which and that's people don't talk about him at this day and age, but that guy was some player. Uh, he was really good. Larry, just a couple more before we let you go. And, um, you talking about the, all the opportunities you had to play with Mr. Palmer. I read a story that you and Mr. Palmer were paired together once out in Hawaii, and it started raining so hard, it was actually coming down sideways. Do you remember that? It was funny. We're going to this little hole. I mean, it, the rain was, was horrible. I mean, it was so bad you couldn't use an umbrella. I mean, there's no way. And the wind was blowing about 45 miles an hour, and 
we're playing this little, we're dead into the wind, dead, dead into the rain on this hole that normally is a drive and a flip wedge. And uh, so we're hitting, we scream our drives out there about, only went about 200 yards. And uh, we're down there and Arnold's going down the fairway with his driver above his head like that priest in the Caddyshack movie. <laughs> we're gonna go. We're gonna go. I mean, the guy was so funny. It was humble. I mean, there's nobody around to see it. That was just for the guys in our group. Just nobody would dare be. You know, the other people didn't have to be out there. weren't out there. I want to go back to uh, you know playing other sports, and you also played baseball. And I read that the Boston Braves were actually interested in you as a pitcher. At one point, oh, um, yeah. talk about the, the them romancing you, trying to get you to play baseball. Well, you know, I, I pitched an, an awful lot of no hitters, and there was one some guy would step back and uh, and he talked with the uh, umpire, and he says, "Do you mind if I, you know, borrow your mask and get behind? I want to see this because I was he he'd heard about me and he came out to to see you, watch me in action." And uh, I threw up really fast. Uh, I, uh, I had a, like three, three grades of fastballs, and uh, one of them that had a what we call an in shoot, which is it would break a right hand, it would break into a right hander, and uh, uh, and I had a knuckleball that uh, was kind of a uh, my grip was so and so that I would I would throw a a ball that was almost like a splitter, and it would just come up there and just dive. Down and that's what he was interested in seeing me. Uh, uh, he liked the fastball but anyway. So he, after the game was over, he says, "You know, those some of those your, those balls broke four feet straight down." You know, so uh, I told him. Uh, you know, he started uh, picking me up. You know, he called my mother and and, uh, and he would pick me up and I, we'd go on a bus to uh, Boston and I'd go watch the Braves uh, play up there. It was. <laughs> But what happened? No, I got to that was in, when I was in junior high school, and uh, so I got into uh, uh, I started playing golf about that time. I ser- seriously uh, got started liking golf and got to my freshman year of high school. And the uh, back in those days, if you were a freshman, you couldn't play on the bars. So uh, uh, I, you know, I so one of the, I, I I was playing a lot of baseball at that particular time, so I had to play on the freshman team. And they were terrible. I, and I was like, I, I, I probably wasn't, I'd have to say my, my final opinion was, is that I wasn't a team player type guy. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I'd, uh, I'd get mad if a guy muffed a ball and stuff like that. So I, it's like when I, when I, <clears throat> when I weighed out baseball versus golf, I looked at golf and I said, you know, if I, screw up. It's my own fault. Nobody else is to blame. And I really got a lot of peace out of that. And I quit playing baseball my freshman year. Uh, It all happened. I had a no hitter going into the uh, last inning and a little dribbler went down the third baseman and went between his legs and uh, and they called it a the scorer called it a hit. And I thought, well, and I was kind of spoiled. I, you know, I wanted no hitters all the time. But see, the, back then, you have to remember that, that back in those days, we're talking like 19, early 50s. And baseball players didn't make much money at all. I mean, there was no, uh, you know, so it, it didn't enter my mind that uh, there was anything special about it. And I talked about uh, if I if I came out of high school and, I'd have to be, play with a uh, like a, some sort of farm team or something like that, and I just didn't like the whole idea of it. I, I was going to go to the University of Houston and, uh, and, and and play golf down there. Larry, before I let you go, you're a wonderful instructor nowadays at Echelon Golf Club up in Alpharetta, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. Talk about the things you're doing there and how our listeners can, uh, you know, keep up with what you're doing on social media. Well, you know, the, social media has been very good. I've got a lot of nice friends up there. You're one of them. And uh, it's uh, I, I, I have fun with it. You got Elkington and a bunch of guys on there. It's re- it really uh, suits me to a T. 
on Echelon, I, I, I teach kind of a, on a part-time basis. I, you know, I've, at, uh, at my age, I can't get out there all day long. And uh, so I, I just do uh, appointment only and, and limit the amount I teach per week. And uh, uh, I like to practice. Uh, to me, practicing is wonderful. I teach the short game. I'm really, I, I honestly, I, I might have been the first one that, uh, because I had the chipping yips, the reason I quit playing on the on the uh, Champions Tour is I, I I couldn't get it on the green from five feet off the green. It was terrible, and uh, I figured you know I figured a way to do this whole thing with a uh, uh, with no you know just dead wrists, and uh, I figured out a stroke with it that will do good, and I've got things that I tell people. I, I tell them it's a, you know, we got a, a kind of a machine looking stroke and uh, in, I've convinced people to put it in their mind when they feel the nerves coming to go ahead and, uh, and just say, let the machine do it. And it really does work. Uh, uh, I, I teach a lot of power players uh, even though I'm not uh, able to hit it that long anymore, but I do know some about hitting it long. And uh, but you know, in, in this day and age, right now, it's uh, it's really fun because the equipment is. I mean, man, the equipment is perfect, and it? it's beautiful. Well, Larry, I can't thank you enough for coming back and be a part of the show. It's a huge thrill getting to spend some time with you. It was earlier this year. It is again tonight, and I hope you'll come back and join me again sometime real soon. You got it, Chris. Thank you. I appreciate you, Larry. All the best to you and your family. Bye-bye now. That's Larry Mowry, M-O-W-R-Y. You can follow him on Twitter. At 82 years old, he's very active on Twitter. He's at Larry underscore Mowry on Twitter. I highly encourage you to follow him and uh, see all the things that he is posting out there on Twitter and on social media. He's a, he's a wonderful man, and I look forward to having him back on the show again real soon. All right, before I get to my next guest, David Ogren, I want to remind you about uh, a couple of our sponsors. First, our good friends over at the Ben Hogan Golf Equipment Company. Now, folks, if you haven't hit Ben Hogan Iron since maybe the 80s or the 90s, I'm telling you, do yourself a favor. Get a demo iron of either their Fort Worth PTX, new PTX Pro, or Edge Irons, and take it out on the range and compare it to whatever it is you have. All Ben Hogan Irons and Wedges are handcrafted one at a time in their Fort Worth, Texas factory. So no mass production, no shortcuts. You can now order custom-made irons, wedges, and hybrids by going online to BenHoganGolf.com. And they're going to build those clubs to your specifications and, best of all, charge you a fraction of the typical retail price. So, again, check out their complete line of forged irons, wedges, utility irons, hybrids, bags, accessories, and their new GS53 driver and fairway woods as well. Go online to find all that information out at BenHoganGolf.com. And folks, this, this segment of the show is sponsored by our good friends over at the PGA Tour Superstore. This segment of the show is brought to you by the PGA Tour Superstore. See why golfers everywhere are proud to call PGA Tour Superstore their golf pro shop. Visit them online at PGATourSuperstore.com. Now back to Chris and more of the show. And now joining me here on the French Lake Resort guest line is former PGA Tour pro David Ogren. Let me give you a little bit of background on David. He is from Waukegan, Illinois, which is about 35 miles north of Chicago. Played his college golf at Texas A&M, where he was a four-year letterman. He won the individual title at the 1976 All-American JUCO Freshman Tournament and the 1979 Harvey Penick Intercollegiate Tournament. And he was named an All-American in 1978 and 79. Graduated with his degree in economics. David played on the PGA Tour from 1983 to 2000. Played on the Champions Tour as well for a couple of seasons in 2008 and 9. He won the 1996 Texas Open, uh, defeating Jay House by one stroke and a guy you might have heard of, Tiger Woods, by two. He also won a couple of times out on the South American Tour. Over the course of his PGA Tour career, he had 32 top 10 finishes and 86 top 25s. After playing on tour, he's been the director of instruction at some courses around the state of Texas and Wyoming. He was also the director of instruction at Top Golf over in San Antonio, and I'm very thrilled he is with me tonight here on Next on the Tee. Hey, David, thanks for joining me tonight. Chris, thank you. I'm glad to finally get on the show with you. I appreciate you. So, David, I want to start by going back to your time in college and was sort of curious, why Texas A&M? 
It's a pretty good story. Uh, the coach at Texas A&M uh, when I was um, getting out of high school was Bob Ellis. Bob is now in the College uh, Golf Coaches Hall of Fame. But Bob had a brother, Arthur Ellis, who uh, had won the 1963 uh, Illinois Amateur. And my dad and, and um, Arthur had played a lot of golf together. And so this was before the AJGA. This is before National Junior Rankings. This is when recruiting was all word of mouth. And um, Arthur kept uh, Bob um, informed of me. And finally, uh, my senior year, uh, Coach Ellis offered me a full scholarship to go to A&M, and I took it. And it uh, was one of the, the great blessings in my life to um, go to A&M and uh, basically end up becoming a Texan. And David, as I was kind of looking back over some stories that I read about you in the beginnings and all that sort of thing, I also found out your sister Alicia is a pretty darn good golfer in her own right, played at Oklahoma State on a golf scholarship. Talk about your sister's game. Well, I have two sisters. Alicia, um, Alicia is uh, currently a professor at Oklahoma State. Uh, her uh, pro career uh, kind of got cut a little bit short uh, by mononucleosis and some other stuff, but because of her golf, and this is a this is a good um, uh, a good thing for girl golfers. Because of her golf, she kept up with her golf. She ended up going into the corporate world and ended up being the chief marketing officer for Snap On Tools out of uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin. And wow. she credits her ability to play golf with the big boys, you know, the corporate big boys to a part of her rise through the corporate world. Now she's um, a professor at uh, Oklahoma State. I call her Dr. Sis. She just got her PhD. <laughs> my, other sister, my other sister, Claudia, didn't have the uh, uh, the notoriety that Alicia and I had um, in the golfing world, but she can still play a pretty good uh, game of golf. And um, uh, I kid her that um, we go out and play once a year at Christmas, and uh, she'll shoot something like uh, 40. 739, and I keep kidding her that the second half of her season is always better than the first half of her season. <laughs> That's great. And David, looking back at your college career, you played against some pretty tough talent in the Southwestern Conference at that time. You look at the University of Houston, had Freddie Couples, Ed Fiore, Keith Burgess were there, Lance Tembrock was at uh, Texas, David Edwards at Oklahoma State. Talk about what it was like playing against those guys during your college days. Well, uh, I had a great experience at A&M. Now, I, uh, the reason why I went to A&M is uh, I, I wanted to be a big fish in a big pond. And the Southwest Conference uh, was one of the best golf conferences um, in America with the University of Texas, University of Houston, and Southern Methodist University. And so I got to A&M, and A&M wasn't what A&M is today. It was a little bit of a, a backwater golf school when Coach Ellis took over. And I was at the forefront of it becoming, you know, a, you know, a, a force, I guess, in, in uh, collegiate golf. But I played against um, Payne Stewart. I played against uh, Ed Fiore. I played against um, John Stark, uh, who won the Western, uh, yeah, the Western Amateur. And I were Texas, Phil Blackmar. And, um, it was a great time to be in school and play golf. David, one of the great Aggie alumni that's become very important to me here on the show is is Bobby Nichols. I've had the privilege of talking to Mr. Nichols a couple of times. He's a major champion, having won the 64 PGA. I was just curious, did you ever have an opportunity? Did he ever, did he ever come back to A&M and, and talk to the golf team when you were there? No, my interaction with Bobby <clears throat> happened out on the road. In fact, the last time I can remember having a discussion uh, with Bobby, we were both at <clears throat> excuse me Dave Pelz's, um World Putting Championship down at Disney World, which uh, you know was a one or two short-lived years of existence. But I remember the, him, him distinctly telling me that if he had known then what he knew now, he would have had his hips replaced about four years earlier. Oh, that's a Bobby Nichols story that uh, you might not <laughs> know about. Um, uh, yeah, <clears throat> you know A and M didn't have. Um, you know, Bobby, uh, he he did talk about um, going there, and um, uh, you know, I, I guess Bear Bryant gave him the golf, gave him the football scholarship to play golf before Bear moved on to um, Alabama. <clears throat> so um, yeah, I, I I I I don't know Bobby very well, but you know, he's a featured alumni. 
David, uh, as I was looking over your uh, your PGA Tour career, um, you know the '83 Bing Crosby was, I think, maybe your second event when you uh, turned pro and uh, got onto the PGA Tour. And I was sort of looking at that final leaderboard. You finished, I think, tied for 44th. Your paycheck was $958.57. It's it's sort of it's amazing how how things have changed, right? You look back at the BMW Championship just a couple of weeks ago. And the guys that won uh, that uh, ended up in 44th place got 32,375. I think Tom Kite barely made more than that for winning the Crosby that year. And guys out, out you know, on tour now are winning, you know, a million, a million five, a million six. Are you surprised? Is, is it really take you back looking over, you know, what the money that you played for versus the money the guys are out there playing for now? You know, Chris, I just had this conversation not too long ago when I won the Texas Open. It was like $218,000 or something, which seemed all the money in the world at the time. And uh, the discussion went something like, I know these guys are playing for $15 million right now. But to be honest with you, the amount of money that's at stake doesn't really affect how you feel inside. It's the thrill of the, the of winning the thrill of uh, having a high placement on a PGA Tour event that um, that gets your um, you know gets your uh, adrenaline going. So I actually haven't given a second thought about it um, at all about the amount of money. I'm just very um, happy and pleased that um, the tour uh, when I found it, I, I'm I'm in the first graduating class of the All Exempt Tour, and Dean Beeman back then was talking about the tour as it is today. And uh, I'm glad to see that it has um, achieved uh, the heights it has. When I was looking over your career, David, and particularly out at Pebble Beach, talking about the the Crosby, boy, you had you had a fair amount of success playing out there at Pebble. You you finished tied for 17th and 84, tied for 25th and 85, tied for 12th and 89. You were right there in the mix a lot at that tournament. What was it about Pebble that seemed to really fit your eye and uh, help you have a great deal of success? Interesting question, and um, I actually had a friend uh, answer that for me. As we were kind of going over the places where I played fairly well, we discovered that the quality known as ambiance was important to me in performance. And it's just a lot of natural ambiance at Pebble Beach. Um, I, I actually ended up being the kind of guy that stayed over in Pacific Grove more than Carmel. And I just, there's something I just liked about being out there. And the golf courses themselves are difficult enough that it actually rewards somebody who, who can play strategically and keep it in the fairway most of the time. And most of my good tournaments were on years where I drove it pretty straight. And then the courses became playable for me. And I've had some years where I hit it off the map and failed miserably making the cut. But, um, um, you know, just the ambiance and the coolness of playing Pebble Beach in Spyglass Hill and in the early years, Cypress Point, and then later on, uh, Spanish Bay. Not Spanish Bay, excuse me. Um, not Spanish Bay. What's the other one? Poppy Hills. Um, that, that, ma- that made all the difference in the world to me. And David, also looking at that 83 season, you had your best finish in the U.S. Open that year, tied for 13th at Oakmont. Larry Nelson would win that event by a stroke over Watson, but I was curious, what what do you remember about that 83 U.S. Open, and what was it like for you being in the mix? I shot 69 in one of those rounds in an era where Oakmont is impossible to play. Uh, And I remember the weather delays, the weather delays, the weather delays. And then I got to finish on Sunday, and I I don't don't remember what I shot. And then um, the weather delay hit. And then Larry Nelson came out the next morning, made his putt across the green on 16 and ended up winning the tournament. And David, in in 85, you and Hal Sutton had a big battle at the St. Jude Memphis Classic. Uh, He would he would go on to hole a 30 footer to to win in, in sudden death. But that was a heck of a tournament for you as well. Talk about what you remember about that battle against Hal. Well, I, I played really good that week. Hal shot 65 in both the uh, first round and the last round. So he was 14 under on the Thursday Sunday rounds, and uh, we we tied at nine under par for the tournament. And I just played a really good steady uh, tournament the whole way. I I got on a little bit of a roll and uh, just was playing really good golf. 
And I remember having a really good putting week. And the greens at uh, Colonial were a little bit grainy Bermuda. And sometimes it got difficult to putt. But I had a wonderful putting week. Got in the playoff. And um, the, the playoff itself is actually on YouTube. It's one of the clips of me on tour on YouTube. And I, I, I drew the number one out of the hat. And I got up and I hit this drive. And I kind of, I, I, I hit it right in the middle of the club face, but kind of hit it about eight yards to the right of where I was trying to hit it. And this thing rolls all the way down to the bottom of the hill and leaves me about 215 to the front edge. And then Hal gets up. And this drive takes off of his driver at about a 45 degrees angle up and to the right. I mean, it's like the worst, worst shots you'll ever see Hal hit on film. And he's over in the woods and they find his ball. Uh, I, it could have been lost, but they found it and he kind of plays out, probably leaving himself 140 yards or something, just barely nudges it out of the woods. And I'm sitting down there and I'm in, I'm in the flat, but the fairways at, um, Colonial or Common Bermuda. And my ball was just in a depression. So Hal's in the fairway, and I've got a forward shot to the green, and I'm just the opposite of Larry Mowry. My strength is in my wedges, so I decide to play a nine iron over safe, and Hal kind of hits a flyer to the back edge of the green, and I hit a really good wedge shot in there 10 feet. And then Hal gets over his putt, and I turn to my kid, and, and, and his name was Jeff, and I said, Hal's over the putt, and he's lining it up, and I turn to him, and I go, uh-oh. And son of a gun, he knocks it in, and then I have this 10-footer, hit a really good putt, it didn't go in, and I end up not winning the tournament. And that's what I remember about that. Let's skip forward to uh, 96, and that was another great season for you. You had five top 10 finishes that year. You get your win at the Texas Open. What was it like, not only the fact that you beat Jay Haas and Tiger Woods, oh, by the way, but getting your first win in Texas as a Texas A&M alumni? Yeah, so I mean, I'm not only am I an A&M alumni, but I'm a, I'm actually a, a resident of the San Antonio area, so I'm commuting to the tournament from home. <clears throat> um, uh, the the day I had the afternoon tea time, I actually had to take my uh, car to Goodyear to get a tire replaced. You know, this kind of stuff. The the, the at home stuff is happening while I'm playing the tournament. And um, again, I I got off to a good start. I made I made a really weak bogey uh, to finish the first round. And then the second round, I played a really nice round of golf. I shot 67. And then on Saturday, I shot 65, ended up with a lead. Um, and I get up on the first hole on Sunday, and I hit a pretty good drive that just kind of gets in the left rough. Now, what had happened was we had a hurricane come through Texas about two weeks before the tournament, and the rough was, like, super deep. It was, like, more than U.S. Open rough. They just couldn't get the mowers to it. So I chopped this thing down the fairway and it had like 250 to the hole on the par five hole. And I hit the three wood over the green and uh, got a squirrely lie and pitched up about 12 feet. And I made that right in the middle of the hole. And after that, um, you know, I, I make a couple birdies and I come to the sixth hole with a four shot lead. And then I had this lemony snicket series of unfortunate events. I make a triple bogey on the sixth hole. Oh, yeah, I know. So walking up to the seventh tee uh, at La Cantera, this really strange kind of piece came over to me, and I turned to my caddy, Brad, and I said, Brad, I just made a triple bogey and did not lose the lead. And I promptly made four birdies in a row. So, um, wow. And then from there, it was just, I kind of seesawed my way in to a one-shot victory. Uh, the final touch on this, this is the year that Jesper Parnovic kind of messed up the scoreboard at the British Open. And I uh, did be, I had this 10-footer for par in 18, and I went over to the rules official, Vaughn Moise, and I said, Vaughn, are all the scoreboards correct? And he goes, yes. And I lagged it down there for a six-inch or tapped it in and won my tournament. Wow. That's an awesome story. <laughs> David, um want to get your thoughts. You have a wonderful website, davidogren.com, where you've got playing lesson videos on there. and let our listeners know about the the great stuff that they're going to find when they go on your website. Well, I, I'm a member of the Golf Channel Academy system. So the Golf Channel Academy people help me um, out with my website, and I get to produce some videos in the studio, which are a lot of fun to do. Um, you know, they, they got I got nine or ten videos on there, and uh, I'm actually going in studio in a couple weeks to shoot nine or ten more. So I got these content of all the stuff that I've learned along the way. Um, 
And uh, uh, on my website, you can also make a make a reservation for a, a lesson, which I very much would uh, like to help people out. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, it's a fun website. I, I do a lot of stuff. Um, I got my own place now at the David Ogren Golf Academy. So it's kind of fun being an entrepreneur and a director of everything and a, and a coach and a teacher and all that. One of the videos on there caught my attention. It's, it talks about how to have better balance through our swings. And I think that's an area that uh, it, it seems pretty basic, but I think a lot of us struggle with. Tell our listeners, how do we go about making sure we have better balance during the course of our swing? Well, ba- balance is one of the lessons that I give give people. And um, the, the technique I show in this video, I actually learned from a guy named Chuck Hogan. And he has it in his book, Learning Golf, which is a old, fabulous old book that it's, it's worth having on your shelf. But anyway, um, when, when, uh, I test people for their balance, it's really easy a lot of times to push people onto their heels. And when you're on your heels, your body is sensing that you're too close to something. If somebody invades your space at a party, kind of get back on your heels and go, Hey, you know, give me some space here. Uh, the opposite, which I see a lot less often, is people standing too far away from it. They'll be over on your toes, kind of reaching out, and you can push them forward. So I see a lot of people on their heels standing too close to the ball. And so I get them to either redistribute their weight so that their uh, their body knows that it's not too close to the ball, or I get them further away from the ball. Quite often, it's as much as two or three inches to uh, to get away from the ball. And inevitably, people um, make better athletic motion in balance, and so balance becomes very fundamental to what I uh, what I teach and what I do. David, before I let you go, let our listeners know how can they stay up to date with all the things that you're doing and follow you on social media as well. Well, excellent. So um, they can obviously go to davidogren.com, take a look at that. On Twitter, I'm at dogren. Uh, I do some Twitter stuff on Instagram. I'm Ogren Golf on Facebook. I have, my, of course, my profile page, which is David Ogren. I guess I, I guess I, I guess actually it's uh, hashtag Ogren Golf. And then I have the David Ogren Golf page, which also um, Golf Channel Academy helps me manage that one and get out some really good content. Uh, those are the ways that uh, those are the ways that you can see what I do. Well, David, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your night to, to join me and be a part of the show. I, I've really enjoyed the time. I'm sure I've only scratched the surface of all the great things that you've done over the course of your playing career. I hope you come back and join me again sometime. Well, I I will look forward to it. And now with eight minutes to spare, I get to go out and do my eight o'clock lesson. <laughs> Good for you. Good for your student. I thank you and yes, I look indeed. forward to catching up soon. All the best to you and your family, David. All righty. That's David Ogren, O-G-R-I-N. And uh, David Ogren, is, uh, he's got his own website, right? like I mentioned, davidogren.com, and uh, all the different ways you can follow him on social media. Had a great playing career, you know, and uh, looking back over all the things that he did in the 80s and the 90s, certainly look forward to talking more about that, getting more stories and more playing lessons the next time he joins me. So hopefully that's, uh, like I say, real soon. Before I get to my next guest, Chris Finn, I want to give a shout out to our friends over at Positive Vibes Golf. Go check them out online at PositiveVibesGolf.com and give them a follow on Twitter at P Vibes Golf. Their head covers and putter covers, a very unique way to keep your mind focused on positive thoughts and a great on-course training aid just to stay positive, right? Put positive thoughts, positive images in your mind. That's the best way to have more fun and shoot lower scores. Go see what I mean, again, by checking them out online at PositiveVibesGolf.com. All right, now back with me here on the French Lick Resort guest line is Chris Finn. Chris is the founder of Par for Success, and that's a number four, Par for Success, which is a golf fitness and physical therapy company located up in Cary, North Carolina. They've got an amazing-looking 6,000-square-foot facility up there. They can help you get more out of your golf performance, and if you've got an ache or a pain, they can help alleviate that as well. Chris is a licensed physical therapist, a certified strength and conditioning specialist. He is a Titleist Performance Institute certified as well, and he is also a uh, certified nutrition coach. He's uh, certainly grown par for success. We talked about this last time he was on the show, but really took it out of what was in the back of his car 
and now is a tremendously successful business, one that Sachs Gold, uh, Goldman Sachs, I should say, has as one of their 10,000 small businesses that are poised for growth. And I'm very excited he is back with me again tonight here on Next on the T. Hey, Chris, thanks for coming back on the show. Hey, Chris. Good to be back on. How you been, man? I'm fantastic. How are you? How are things going there? Things are going great. And it's, uh, you know, we're coming to the end of the summer. So you know, it's been, this is kind of, I guess, uh, we start seeing just how good we did a lot of our players on tour and kind of the amateur circuits. And then we get all the guys coming back from all their member members, kind of all battered and banged up and <laughs> kind of try to piece <laughs> them together for the fall season here. So. <laughs> no doubt. Chris, there's a lot I want to get into tonight, and I want to start um, by talking a little bit about nutrition. And, and for those of us that, you know, have early morning tea times on the weekends, you know, my buddies, you know, my buddies will do one of two things. They're either grabbing a donut on the way out of the house, or they're going to have a full sit-down breakfast spread with the eggs and the bacon and the waffles and the orange juice, the, sort of the whole shebang. Yeah. What should we be eating to get ourselves, get our bodies fueled up for a round of golf? Well, I guess the question, the bigger question is, are they doing the mimosa or the Bloody Mary beforehand? In most cases? <laughs> <laughs> I think that may be the one piece. They're leaving the alcohol out of it. But uh, my buddy Bob yeah. is all about the juice. You got to have the orange juice. The juice. You got to have the whole shebang. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I think when it comes to nutrition, obviously, it, there's lots of different philosophies out there. I think, you know, there's certainly a lot of different, you know, fad diets of, you know, the big one right now is keto or, um, you know, where you're kind of pretty much no carbs at all. There's, you know, South Beach, whatever, you know, the, the avenue that somebody takes. I think it kind of it's the easy way to think about it from a performance standpoint, kind of on the golf course is just kind of you kind of take a step back and look at the science of it. And I think, um, you know, before the you go out and play around a golf, I think, I think I always use the analogy of a of a your car. When you're driving to the golf course in the morning, if you run out of gas, you're going to miss your tea time. Um, you know, so you need to make sure you fill up with the right kind of gas before you get out to the course. And the, the gas that the human body uses on the golf course is carbohydrates or glucose. Um, so basically the donut, <laughs> um, that will give that person a, a good spike of energy in terms of the carbohydrates. The sugar is going to go really high. Um, so they'll probably feel fine for the first couple holes, but what that person will tend to see would be a basically a the way we don't like to see, say, the stock market go, and then just a big crash. Um, so you'll start, you know, feel hungry. You may, you know, depending on how much you, other stuff you've eaten or drank, you, you just feel not very good um, in general. So I think pre-round avoiding kind of high sugar content foods is definitely uh, recommended. Um, so that guy for the eating the donut, probably going to be fine for the first couple holes, but they're likely going to see a pretty big crash come after that. They're probably calling the cart girl for some other processed bar or something of that nature, you know, by about the third or fourth hole. Um, so that the problem with that strategy is it basically becomes a, a yo-yo game where you're just constantly trying to get your sugar, your blood sugar back up after it's tanked because you burned all the simple sugars that you just ate. Um, so does that make sense for for that guy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So then you know then if I so, if you go with the full spread guy, <laughs> um, you know you know what do you typically see from a full spread? You know what would be a typical full spread you see that they have in the morning? No, oh, they got the waffles, they got the eggs and the bacon, the orange juice, so that that sort of whole big breakfast thing. Yep. So yeah, I think that it's just simple to think about it. There's kind of fancy word is called macronutrients. Uh, basically, there's three general categories if you want to think about it of food. You have your carbohydrates, which would be like your breads, your waffles in that case, uh, an English muffin if you're if you're getting a breakfast sandwich. Um, and then you'd have, so those are the things prior to the round that are definitely, especially if you're walking, really important to have. Um, and then you're going to have your, your, your fats, which um, they kind of get a bad rap. But now with keto coming, they're getting a good rap. Um, you know, those are important, you know, the fat is basically what helps to coat a lot of your your nerve your nerves and your neurons and that's kind of what gets you to move we all talk about speed in golf and um you know the better myelinated those are the, the more efficiently those are those signals are transmitted the more coordinated timings better that those sorts of things um so fats are an important piece too they also are digested a little bit slower 
Um, so they will help to sustain kind of a, a, a more level um, layer of kind of a glucose level or blood sugar level as opposed to the guy who just popped the donut, um, probably with the Bavarian cream in the middle. Um, but then, uh, so, so, so if you think of the of fats, you're going to get that from your bacon. So like two strips of bacon is so like, is a great, you know, great thing to have before around. Um, you're going to get some of the fats if you got the yolks and the eggs. Um, and then you're going to get a little bit of protein out of the eggs. So depending how many eggs you get, you get obviously get a little bit of protein from the bacon as well. Um, so you generally, I would say you want a little bit more of a, of a healthier carb heavy uh, pre-round meal that isn't necessarily going to spike your blood sugar. So like, like a bacon, egg and cheese sandwich, um, you know, assuming it's not incredibly greasy, um, you know, isn't actually not a terrible pre-round meal. Um, you know, if you're grabbing that at the, you know, at the grill before you're heading out, um, you know, think of because you've gotten the car, you know, predominant carbs, you get a little, you know, get two pieces of bacon, don't get eight. Um, you know, then if you get a couple eggs on there, you know, you've gotten a little bit of each of those categories of the macronutrients. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of one of the simplest ways to think about it from a, a pre-round uh, meal. So that, that spread you mentioned, eggs, waffle, and bacon actually isn't terrible, depending how much butter and, uh, and syrup he puts up on his, on his waffle there. But, um, that's actually not a terrible start. Now, if he drinks four cups of, of juice and he's all sugared up, that probably ain't going to help him, but. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but overall, not, that that would be a better option than the donut. So talk about on course, right? So we we've we've had our breakfast, you know, prior to the round. We're making the turn, or through the course of you know the finishing up seven, eight, nine, or maybe you know at, after the turn, we're st- now we're starting mm-hmm. to get a little hungry. What what are some things that we can eat, maybe have in our bag, in our golf bag, to uh, to kind of keep us fueled up through the rest of the uh, second part of the round? Yeah, so I think, you know, that that's a good pre-round is kind of thinking of that a little more carb heavy than, than anything. And then I think you're going to do same idea or thought process when you're on the course as you're using energy. You know, typically if you walk 18 holes, you're going to burn close to 2,000 calories. Um, so you know, if you think of the, the regular recommended quote unquote diet by the government is, you know, 2,000 calories a day. That's what all of your percentages and all the labels are, are rec- based off of. You pretty much are going to almost burn that while you're walking the golf course. If it's hotter, you probably burn more. Um, so you do need to take in a good amount of caloric intake. Otherwise you'll be operating at what's called a, you know, a, a basically a caloric deficit, which at that point you're starting to tap into your energy stores and your muscles. And if we're talking performance, that's not going to bode well on 15, 16, <laughs> you know, 17 and 18. <laughs> um, so, so, so I think that's where you then look at. Um, you know, some of the good, um, like simple suggest, like PB and J is a, that's a great one that travels well, particularly hot in the summer. Um, uh, turkey, cheese, ham and cheese sandwiches, those sorts of things. Um, better in the not so warm weather. Those get kind of nasty when the cheese starts melting in your bag. Um, um, so, but yeah, thinking, I think like sandwiches are a good portable option for a lot of people. Um, you know, they, they also, there's lots of energy bars that are out there. I think the one thing you want to look out for with those is the sugar va- content, you know, try to stay within single digit sugar values. So you see a lot of like the protein energy bars, we have 20, 30 grams of protein, but then if you look and you'll get, you know, 30 to 40 grams of carbs, which is basically like two pieces of bread, which is good. Um, but then you may, you know, in some of them, you may get, you know, 30 grams of sugar. So that's basically, you might as well just have a donut and then a protein shake with the donut. Um, so that's where you do want to watch the sugar is kind of the bigger thing from a performance standpoint in terms of just trying to avoid, you know, peaks and valleys in terms of being stable with their performance. And, um, you know, then it's a matter of some people prefer to have, you know, a half a sandwich every couple of holes or a quarter of a sandwich every couple of holes. Um, other people will do maybe a sandwich at the turn and they may snack on, you know, like a trail mix with some nuts and grain, you know, that sort of a thing in between to kind of, sustain them at a pretty level um, level basis. I think the key that we just need to think about that we don't think about in golf is, you know, it's it's a four hour to six hour event. It's like the length of time of a marathon, you know, not of <laughs> not of an elite level marathoner, but yeah, that's a, that's an extreme long period of time that you're being active. And if it's sunny out, you know, that adds other elements of how much you're burning. So yeah, you know, just don't starve yourself and and then wonder why you 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 tripled the last three holes. 
Yeah, and and you, as you mentioned, being out in the sun and that sort of thing. Let's talk. Let's transition a little bit to hydration. I think we all know we're supposed yep. to hydrate on the course and that sort of thing. But is, are, are the are the Gatorades and the Powerades and all that sort of stuff? You mentioned sugar, so you know mm-hmm. my immediate thought is we should be drinking water. But are the Gatorades and Powerades good for us or bad for us based on that sugar content? Yeah, and I, I think it's, you know, as with, you know, any exercise or any nutrition, I think it's rare that something is like bad for you. It's, I think it's when you have too much of it or, you know, when you don't use it in the right way. And I think that's unfortunately where a lot of the energy drinks have gotten misused in terms of our Gatorade or you know, the electrolyte replenishment drinks. Yeah, you, know, you know, there's two servings in a regular, you know, a standard kind of one of those, or sometimes there's four, depending on how big you get, I guess. Um, but, you know, I think read the label and understand how many servings are in the size bottle you bought. Um, and it's what I'll tell a lot of my players with the Gatorade is if you take one bottle of Gatorade, you know, say 20 ounce bottle of Gatorade, you know, if you cut it into, you know, a third of it into each water bottle that you fill up, then you're at least you're kind of staying the, the level of sugar throughout a little bit more evenly. So it's not a big sugar burst in front of you. Uh, you know, you get on the, you know, the third tee and you down a whole Gatorade. That's a lot of sugar. <laughs> um, so, you know, they make other supplement, you know, uh, powders you can put in. Noon is one that a lot of people use. Um, you know, there's, so I think that's the big thing is looking at sugar. Um, I think there's actually hydration is a bit of a contentious debate in the research in terms of its actual impact on, uh, sport performance. Um, so the, you know, historically, you would say if you lost more than 2% of your body weight, and that's, I'm sure we all know the guy who sweats a ton and needs to change his shirt on the ninth hole. Um, you know, that guy is going to have a higher sweat rate than, you know, somebody else who doesn't look like they've even been outside for the last two hours. Um, so I think depend, they're actually are looking into now more what's, what are called individualized hydration plans for, you know, particularly at the, you know, for talking the guys playing for $15 million last weekend. Um, you know, most of them are going to have individual hydration plans where they actually measure how much they sweat and they're going to be basically given a specific amount of, of fluid and sodium and you know, it's basically electrolytes, you know, as they're out there based on the temperature that it is and, and their personalized sweat rate. Um, so the average golfer, we're not going to do that. But I mean, that's how that sort of individualized plan and some of the research more recently has shown promise in terms of its impact in terms of performance. Um, but there's, you know, others just in terms of generally hydrating, they did an interesting study with cyclists and they basically dehydrated some of them like 3% of their body weight, some 2% and some they didn't dehydrate at all. They did like a blind study. So they thought they were dehydrated, but they really weren't. Um, and there was no performance difference at the end of a 25 kilometer cycling of you know, race. Um, hmm. So I think there's a little bit of difference that you see there. And I will say with our, like with some of our golfers, we have, you know, one of our uh, junior golfers, she, she wasn't eating at all or drinking <laughs> on the golf course. And we, we actually tracked her rounds and she actually was five strokes higher on her second nine holes uh, relative to her first nine holes and consistently. Uh, and then we would see in a two day event, particularly in the summer, her total average score would go up by about three strokes. Um, so then we, we implemented a specific, you know, similar to what I talked about earlier with, you know, here's your breakfast. Let's eat, eat something every three to, you know, three to four holes. We're going to, our goal is to drink, you know, one entire Gatorade kind of cut over the course of the four hours through, I think we did four water bottles. And in kind of getting her to do that, we'd said, we'll just try it for two tournaments and see what we saw, you know, see what happens. We actually saw her back nine became better by two strokes on average on those two rounds. And her second round was better by five strokes relative. So you saw a seven stroke swing, um, you know, on, in that second round just by being hydrated. Um, so it's a case study, wow. but it's, it's, it's stuff that you see regular on a regular basis with competitive golfers. And so that, you know, depending how serious the, you know, the weekend guy is, you know, that can it will impact them differently, but it, it can, it makes a huge difference in terms of, your ability to focus, if we look at your ability to, you know, for the nervous system to fire and how, you know, if we talk about sequencing and timing, um, you know, both the guest before me was talking a lot about balance in terms of how important that is for him when he's teaching his students. All of that's nervous system related. And if your blood sugar's tanked in the tank, uh, you're, you know, you're dehydrated. There's you know, some evidence out there that that's actually going to be 
more challenging for you to accomplish. Chris, switching gears a little bit and talking about huge differences, yesterday you put out an article on simplyfaster.com, and that's S-I-M-P-L-I-F-A-S-T-E-R, simplyfaster.com, about the evolution of speed and power and the golf swing. And gone are the days when, you know, beer belly guys are making it out there on the PGA Tour. Those guys are all in fantastic shape. And, and like you wrote, we are now seeing a direct correlation between how far a golfer can hit the ball and how much money they make. Talk about why we're yep. seeing that evolution in the game. Well, I think, I don't know if it was Brooks or Phil probably said it better than I could say it. And they said something to the effect of, I'll take my wedge out of the, or my eight iron out of the rough against another guy's five iron out of the, you know, out of the fairway and I'll win all day. Um, so and I think that's what you're seeing is, I mean, it, I think historically, you know, sometimes being long had a correlation with being wrong in terms of being in the woods, but these guys are so long and they're so accurate that, you know, they're having two to three clubs, you know, less into the green. So their proximity to the hole is going to be closer so they can score better. Um, and they're so, I mean, they're, they're true power athletes at this point in the game. And if you look at, you know, Rory and Brooks, you know, that leave just those two guys in the last group last weekend. Um, you know, Rory's got the fastest hips. At least last time I checked, <laughs> you know, the fastest hips in terms of degrees per second, uh, in the game of golf. If he doesn't now, he did at one point at over 700 degrees per second. I mean, he's an incredibly fast torsional golfer. Um, you know, and Brooks is, I mean, he's just a, a hell of an athlete and that he's, he's really strong and he can generate a lot of power. Um, and so the, they're able to push through that rough and with a shorter club in their hand. You know, you, if you look at the, I forget what the stat was in that article. Um, the link is in that article there, but I think it was like the, if you looked at the top 15 driver and driving distance, all of them were within the top 50 in the money or it was, it was something pretty you know, compelling. And you've been seeing that happen more and more each year for the last five, six years. Um, that basically the longer the guys are, the more money they tend to make. Just because they hit along doesn't mean they're going to make more money, but there just seems to be a relationship with the guys that are hitting it further. They're making more. So for all of us now, we, we as you mentioned, hip rotation. And for, for those of us that want to generate more hip rotation, want to generate more club head speed and gain a couple of yards on our drives, how can we do that? What are some things that we can be doing to help ourselves get to that point? Yeah, I think one of the simplest things you know without ever stepping foot in the gym just the next time somebody goes to the course you know if they go play tomorrow um you know when they go to warm up um you know just stop static stretching stop you know, trying to touch your toes and hold it for 30 seconds um there was a couple interesting uh, studies that we've seen in the past where they actually had a guy or they had a group of golfers go out and um the group that did static stretching uh, they looked at them compared to a group that did more of a dynamic warm up and did some soft tissue. Kind of, everyone's heard of a foam roll, probably. Um, you know, using a, a, some, a type of foam roll or, or softball or myofascial tool. So they had one group did that and the other group did the static stretching. And compared to their baselines, if they did nothing, they actually saw an 11% difference in how much power they could produce. And the group that did static stretching saw a 5% decrease compared to what they did on a reg, like just cold. Uh, the group who did the more dynamic warm up got their body temperature warmed up. They actually saw a 6% increase compared to doing nothing. So I think just by warming up correctly, um, you know, being dynamic and moving, there's, I mean, there's tons of, you know, go on YouTube and search, you know, five minute, uh, golf fitness warm up on the range. Uh, we have one on our YouTube page. Um, it, that's simply, that would be one of the simplest ways to do it. Um, without really, a, you know, without getting into talking about if you're in the gym, what sort of stuff should you do? And, um, you know, that would be the first thing I would say without changing anything about you, if your hips are tight or whatever, just go do that. And you're going to automatically see an, input, uh, an increase in terms of how much further you can hit the ball or how much, um, how much better you feel just off that first tee instead of waiting until the, you know, fifth tee when you, you've had your four warm up holes. <laughs> right. And, and one of the other things you talk about, Chris, is, you know, kinetic training with things like medicine balls and cables and flywheels and bands, but we don't pay enough attention, you know, to, to the ground and, and um, how that can help us. Talk about what you mean by that. Yeah. So, you know, I think you know, everybody's familiar with, you know, the, the what's called the kinematic sequence, which is a big fancy word for saying, 
you know, your hips move, should move first and then your torso, you know, and then your hands, you know, and then the club should come through last. Like, I think everybody, if they saw somebody swinging a golf club and, you know, you've seen the guy where the, their, their club is already hitting the ball before any other part of their movie, their body has moved from the top of their backswing, like incredibly over the top across, uh, you know, that, that's just not how you should ideally swing the golf club, um, you know, from an efficiency standpoint. So kinematics is looking at, you know, when you look at somebody, you can see what moves first, what moves second. Um, and so there's lots of, you know, a lot of teaching around that instruction around, you know, getting in the right sequence to help the club get on plane. Um, you know, I think what's interesting is when you look at what you said, the kinetics, and that looks at more how you use the ground and the kinetics drive kinematics. So how you use the ground is going to determine what moves first, second, third in a lot of cases. Um, and it, when you start looking at that, it almost becomes like cheating. Uh, you know, look, if you ever get a chance to work with an instructor who has a force plate, um, which basically measures how, measures those kinetic forces. And, and they can, you know, if you've ever got a chance to even just watch somebody give a lesson on one of those, it's incredible what you can do just by teaching. Just don't say anything about the club and they just say, you know, use the ground this way, push off here, think of pushing up, you know, more off that lead leg before you hit the golf ball. And you see incredible increases in speed, uh, and accuracy. Uh, it, it's really, it's incredible. Um, but so for the gym, what that means is, you know, when you're using, uh, you know, most people, they go to the gym, they have a cable machine and, you know, maybe you're doing a, everybody likes the golf looking chop where you kind of start above your shoulder and you pull it down to your, your, your other hip. Um, you know, as you're doing that and as the, the kind of cable comes back behind you, you know, kinetic training would be a matter of, you know, being focused on where your feet are on the ground or as you're throwing a medicine ball and you're loading up to throw it. You know, are you leaning, is there your weight on the outside of that back foot or is your weight, in, you know, on the inside, you know, in your big toe and in your arch? You know, if you took a golf swing and you kind of, you, know, you swayed way back and you rolled to the outside of your feet, you know, I think we'd all agree that's probably not an ideal way to swing a golf club. So when you're in the gym and you're training a rotational movement, we should be thinking about that in terms of when you load into that trail hip, load into the inside of that arch of the foot, grab the ground with your big toe. Now, Gary Player was always famous for kind of, you know, he would kind of you know, dip his knee in, his trail his trail knee in a little bit to help. And then what that did is kind of would help him to post up on that right leg as he turned around um, and drive off the inside of that of that trail foot. And then as you're kind of moving towards that lead leg and whether it's a medicine ball throw or a cable rotation, you know, really try to drive up off that left leg. Uh, if we're talking about rotation to the left, like a right-handed player would be going. You know, think of, uh, you know, Justin Thomas played well last week and he's a huge vertical player. When he swings, you can see his, him almost jumping off the ground. So he uses a kinetic force of the vertical force, which is there's three. There's a horizontal force. There's a torsional, which is your rotation. So Rory uses a ton of rotational. And then there's vertical. JT uses a ton of vertical thrust. Um, so you'll see those guys kind of jumping almost off the ground. That's how he creates a lot of his speed. Um, so when you're in the gym and you're training, most it's very rare that a, a, a amateur golfer is going to be torsional or rotational. Normally will be more horizontal. So think of pushing off that trail foot towards the target. Um, or vertical, where we, if we push more off that lead leg, uh, that's when we'll tend to that hip will clear out and we see big increases in speed. You know, people say, oh, I felt like I really got to my lead side there. I felt really stable, you know, at the finish. Um, so I think if we're looking at in the gym and what a lot of those articles are talking about is, you know, don't necessarily, you know, I don't care if you're going high to low or just pulling straight across or going low to high. Or, you know, if you're using a flywheel or a band or whatever it is, think about your feet. Think about, are you driving off the inside of that trail foot? And are you pushing up, you know, up off that lead leg, almost like you're trying to jump up off of it? So the more force you push down into the ground, the higher you would, quote unquote, jump if you were trying to jump. In the golf swing, the harder you push into that ground, the faster that club is ultimately going to go down through impact. Chris, for our listeners that are now intrigued and want to learn more and, you know, how, how can they get more information about all the great things that you are sharing, or your facility is sharing, whether that's they're going onto your website or they're following you on social media or, as you mentioned a moment ago, your YouTube channel? Yeah, so we're, it's pretty simple. We're just, it's just at par for success. So P-A-R, the number four success. Um, you know, you can go where that's our handle for Twitter, Instagram, um, 
Facebook, um, and then you know we obviously that, that's our YouTube channel's name as well. Uh, we got a ton of videos on there, um, and then you know our website is just parforsuccess.com. Um, and then we do, you know, we typically will do every week. We tend to do kind of a free webinar for people, um, so you can check that out too through any of those, uh, uh, you know, through any of those venues. You'll, you'll see kind of how to get to that. Just basically, it's kind of trying to help people understand, you know, what their limitations are, um, you know, understand where they stand for where they are in their age group, and then we kind of try to help to give them a, uh, basically, we give them a, a free call to kind of chat with them about how they did on the, those assessments that they did see where they're at and then kind of help them to hopefully come up with a plan uh, that they can do kind of wherever they are, you know, in the world to, you know, play better golf longer. Well, Chris, I can't thank you enough for your time and coming back and be a part of the show. There's so much great information, so many great things that you guys are doing. I hope you'll come back from time to time, share more of uh, the information, share some updates and uh, let our listeners know how they can get more out of their game. You're fantastic, my friend. Oh, thank you, Chris. I really appreciate it. And I, I got to say, it's, you're, you're one of the few shows that I keep listening to. <laughs> you know, some shows they get, they get old and you kind of the same stuff, but, um, just the, the way you interview people is so fun to listen to. You can, you pull us just the great stories. And even tonight, all the stories about, you know, on tour and the experiences. It's, uh, it's really fun to listen to. So keep up the great work. And I, I it's an honor to be on the show anytime you'll have me. So I really appreciate you. I appreciate you. Thank you for saying that meant a great deal to me. Take care, Chris. All the best to you and your family. We'll catch up soon. All right, Chris. Have a good one. That is Chris Finn. Again, it's par the number four success dot com, and uh, a lot of great content. I'm, you know, the YouTube channel fantastic. Their website's fantastic because it's got some videos on there as well. And I tell you, one of the things that is so amazing, and, and you know, and I've been playing golf since I'm like 12 years old. Right. And we hear about using the ground and how we can use the ground for force. I don't think we t- we think about that enough, about the connection between us and the ground. Right. Your feet, all of that sort of thing, as Chris talked about, you know, being on the inside and pushing off and all those sorts of things. I think we think about grip and hands and swing and swing plane and all that sort of stuff. I don't think we think enough about, you know, our hip rotation and our connection to the ground and how we can use that to generate more speed. So looking forward to having Chris back as part of the show. Again, parforsuccess.com is his website. They're doing great things up there in Cary, North Carolina. All right, folks, it is time for me to put a bow on this edition of Next on the Team. My sincere thanks that go out once again to Larry Mowry, David Ogren, and Chris Finn for joining me tonight. Please check out our website, nextonthetea.net. There you'll be able to keep up to date with what our guest schedule looks like, so who we've got coming up over the next several weeks. Please check us out online. You can stream or download our show from a lot of great websites, Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Audioboom, Player.fm. Check us out as well on LaunchpadDM.com. Click the subscribe button. We'd really appreciate that very much. Give me your thoughts as well for what you're seeing on the show, hearing on the show, I should say, by going on our Facebook page. Next on the T with Chris Mascaro, you can put a comment there. You can follow me on Twitter, at CT Mascaro, so you can also give me your thoughts there as well. Folks, I can't thank you enough for tuning in to this show again tonight and for making us a part of your golfing content. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends. You've been listening to Next on the G with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA pros and top instructors and media members go to tell their stories. Join us the same time every Tuesday. 